Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima 'allamtana wa zidna 'ilman ya rabbal alamin. Allahumma arzuqna al-ikhlas fi al-aqwal wa al-a'mal. Allahumma jal 'amalana fi ridaka amin ya rabbal alamin. Hayyaka Allah wa hayya Allah at-tullaba والطالبات والسامعين والسامعات بارك الله فيكم في هذه المجلس المبارك I welcome you all the students male and female and those who would listen to this recording inshallah later may Allah bless you with all kind of good in this world and the hereafter and may Allah make this majlis uh, in favor of us and not against us and Allah is capable of doing that alhamdulillah so this majlis is uh, in the book Akhsar al-Muhtasarat and it is a Hanbali fiqh book and uh, this book is very concise very small for the beginners very good book for the beginners and uh, we won't be going too deep into the I know the uh, fiqhi matters because this is for the beginners but the intention of uh, this Dora is to understand the basics concerning the uh, the uh, rulings of fasting and what the mazhab it says concerning it uh, also we must have you know, some basics in our mind when we are studying these books of faith that you may find difference of opinion amongst the scholars and these difference of opinions they resulted uh, because of certain uh, you know like because of certain uh, understanding issues uh, amongst each mazhab these issues are based upon principles they just did not come you know from just uh, from air they are picking up and they are coming up with the rulings no each one of them have their evidences they have their evidences because it cannot be thought of these great scholars of the ummah right from the the the, the biggest of them the biggest of the scholars of our ummah those those who we know them as the aima al arba imam abu hanifa imam malik imam shafi imam ahmad ibn hanbal rahimahullah al jami that they did not come up with these rulings from their own sides. They have their evidences which back what they are writing. But in the books which are written for the beginners, you will never find the evidences. This is something which will come in the later stages. But each one of them have their evidences. Why they differed? This is an issue which is normally dealt with in, uh, you know, like in books uh, specifically written in this area that why is there uh, an ikhtilaf among the scholars when the religion is one, when the Quran is one, when the Sunnah is one, then why is there a disagreement? This is an issue in and of itself which needs sittings, which needs sittings in order to understand it. But basically, all of it's boiled down to the rules, the fundamentals upon which a mazhab is standing. And uh, for some scholars, a hadith may be weak, while for the other, the same hadith may be strong. And then he's taking evidence from it. And this is the reason you find these differences in opinion. So when we are studying these, keep our minds open. We are very, very, very insignificant student of knowledges to open our mouth against any of these scholars. We should be very careful concerning this matter. So here we are not, uh, you know, we have not gathered here to pinpoint at anyone. We are just trying to understand a book. We are trying to understand the ahkam concerning siyam and fasting and we'll try to stick to it. We'll try to stick to the mazhab right now as and when if needed, I'll point out what are the opinions of the scholars concerning this, even if they go against a particular mazhab. There are opinions, for example, this Hanbali fiqh that we are studying. You'll, you'll find scholars, uh, uh, they have their opinions which goes against the Hanabila itself. But if it is correct, we accept it. So. I'll try to point out as and when, if needed, because as I said, we'll not go too deep into this issue. We'll just try to, uh, as they say, unwind and, uh, you know, like, we'll try to open up the statements and expressions and what they mean. This is what the intention and the aim is. So, the Musannif Rahimahullah, he begins with Kitab Usiyam. So, the author, he says, Kitab Usiyam, Book of Fasting. Month of Ramadan, it... Uh, it has a lot of virtues and benefits. We, we don't need to you know, explain these things. There are numerous ibadat, the worships which one can do in this month, uh, which can bring one closer to Allah. This month is the month of fasting. This month is the month of 
prayers, be it obligatory or be it voluntary. This month is the month of standing in prayer in the night. This month is the month of zakat. Mostly people, they think that you know, this is a virtuous month and mostly they give out their zakat in the month of uh, Ramadan. This is the month of sadaqat. This is the month of doing Umrah because Prophet Sallallahu said the Umrah in this month is like equivalent to doing Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just a minute, I need to change the settings because I want students to join directly without needing my permission. So just a minute. Okay, they should be able to join directly now. Okay, so this is uh, the month of Umrah. This is a uh, month which has great standing in the sight of Allah. And uh, what is enough to know the status and standing of this month in the sight of Allah is the statement uh, of Prophet Sallallahu in a hadith wherein uh, Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah says, Was sawmuli wa ana bihi. The fasting is for me and I'm, I am the one who will reward it. And there are three ibadat uh, for which Allah himself has taken the reward upon. And he will. he is the one who said that its reward is not any, we normally know that reward of a deed, a good deed, it varies from like 10 times to 700 times to even more. But three kinds of ibadat are there. The reward of it is Allah has stored to himself. He will reward as per his wish. And when, uh, you know, the Lord of the worlds, if he has taken it upon himself, then you can imagine what would be the reward of this great ibadah. And one of them is a song. The other one is sabr. And the third one is al-afu, to forgive and pardon. So, we ask Allah, Nas'alullah Azza wa Jalla, in yuballighana wa iyaakum haza shahar al-fadil fi iman wa afiyah. We ask Allah to make us reach, us and all of you, to this uh, virtuous month with full of iman and good health. The best way in which the righteous people and the scholars of the past, the uh, aslaf of the ummah, how they welcomed this month is by pondering over the rulings and ahkam related to, to, to this month and asyam. This is what the best way they could welcome this month, to know the rulings concerning it, to know the rulings concerning the Qiyam, to know the ruling concerning Atiqaf, for whoever Allah made it easy for him to do Atiqaf in this month, to know the Ahkam and rulings concerning the Zakat. Because as we said, there are people who give Zakat in this month. So uh, this is what you know we should be concerned about. As against those kind of people, majority of them are those who are like welcoming this month, why, uh, you know, like preparing for foods, welcoming this month in other umur of the or matters of the dunya, welcoming this month in, you know, things which have no benefit actually. This month, it should be welcomed upon good. It should be welcomed in a way that we know uh, Allah uh, made this month obligatory and fasting in this month obligatory in order for us to so that we may acquire and gain taqwa. So our ultimate aim should not be to, uh, you know, eating and drinking and to busy ourselves with these kind of things. Rather, our ultimate aim should be to focus on how to gain taqwa in this month. May Allah make it easy for us that we spend the month uh, in the way that Allah, uh, you know, he has requested out of us. The author says, Kitab Siyam. Siyam, uh, in the language, linguistically, it means al-imsaq. Any holding back from anything is is, is a siyam. This is what uh, linguistically it means. As Allah says concerning Maryam alayhi salam, that you have to do siyam from uh, speaking. Don't speak uh, anything to anyone. This was siyam, imsak. So mujarrad imsak, just uh, holding back oneself from uh, something is siyam. But when it comes to uh, the sharia, it has a different definition. It has a different meaning. It means imsakum biniyatin. It is holding back yourself restraining yourself with an intention from certain things al ashia al mukhal maksusa and we'll talk about what are those ashia what are those things which a person should refrain and restrain himself from which are known as mufattirat uh, as which we'll discuss inshallah a little later so a person has to restrain himself with the intention of restraining from these specific things in a specific time and this is obligatory upon specific people who are those that the author will discuss in a short while from now. Then the author says, It is obligatory upon every Muslim, Mukallaf, Qadir, Biru, Yatil, Hilal. 
ओके इट इज ऑब्लीगेटरी अपॉन हु मुस्लिम इन कुल्लु मुस्लिम कुल्लु मुस्लिम इन मुकल्लफ इन कादिर इन अपॉन एवरी मुस्लिम मुकल्लफ कादिर नाउ मुस्लिम वी ऑल नो हु इज अ मुस्लिम द मुस्लिम हु हैज एंटर्ड द फोल्ड ऑफ इस्लाम बाय अटरिंग द कलिमा शहादा बाय अटरिंग द टेस्टिमनी ऑफ फेथ ला इलाहा इल्लल्लाह व अशहदु अन ला इलाहा इल्लल्लाह व अशहदु अन मुहम्मदन अब्दुहु व रसूलुहु दिस पर्सन हैज एंटर्ड द फोल्ड ऑफ इस्लाम he is a muslim so it is obligatory upon this individual it is obligatory upon this individual to now fast so it is obligatory upon who upon muslim number 1 number 2 mukallaf who is a mukallaf mukallaf is a person when two things combine <clears throat> when two things combine then such a person is known as mukallaf al baligh wal aqil al baligh and al aqil al baligh we all know the one who has reached the age of the one who has become an adult and there are certain signs of becoming an adult for example uh, the growth of uh, you know pubic hairs likewise uh, ejaculation and uh, in case of women there is one more sign which is the uh, beginning of the uh, monthly uh, menses so these are signs of reaching uh, bulugh or becoming an adult so a person who is an adult plus a person who is sane when these two qualities they combine in a person then such a person is known as mukallaf which means now this person is uh, addressed by the sharia this person is addressed by the sharia and has he has to come up with the commands and obligations and prohibitions and has, he has to observe these things if he doesn't do he will be held responsible in the sight of allah so such a person is known as mukallaf so, so number one muslim which means a kafir a disbeliever if he fasts then his fast will have no value Allah will not accept this fast, but this person will be held accountable in the hereafter for each day of Ramadan, which will pass by him, which he has not fasted. He will be held responsible for it. But if he fasts, it will be it will not be acceptable. Why? Because he has not come up with the basic condition of acceptance of ibadat, which is al Islam. So, in order for the ibadat to be accepted, a person must come up with the with its condition, and first and foremost among them is al Islam. so a fasting of a kafir will not be acceptable allah will not accept it but he will be held accountable for every day of fast which he has not fasted in this world second condition as i said it is being a mukallaf mukallaf i said it is baligh aqil bulugh which means a child of you know like at the age of 7 years or 8 years it is not obligatory upon him to fast if he fasts allah will reward him allah will reward him if he fasts allah will reward him but it is not obligatory upon him, which means if he doesn't fast allah will not uh, hold him accountable in the hereafter likewise when we say baligh then we mean the saghir a small child is now out of question when we say aqil the one who is sane who is not insane like this is against the mad man a mad man a majnoon it is not obligatory upon him uh, in fact uh, the sharia has not addressed him at all there is no obligation of fasting upon him like a mad man because he has no niyyah he has no intention so even such a person is not addressed by the sharia because robert sallallahu alaihi wasallam said rufi al qalamu an salasa pen has been lifted from three kind of people and one of them is robert sallallahu alaihi wasallam said as sabi a small child until he becomes an adult so the pen has been lifted from this person likewise the third one is al qadir the third one is al qadir qadir means he should not be sick person should not be sick then if he is sick then he is not qadir so fasting is not obligatory upon a mareez but the mareez the kind of sick person where it is hoped that he will recover from his illness then he will only he is only not addressed to fast right now in the month of ramadan but he has to make up later when he regains his health then he has to fast later so qadir here it, uh, in this sense it means a person who should not be mareez who should not be mareez this is what is being meant here then the author rahimahullah he says qala al muannif rahimahullah bi ru'yatil hilali now here he is talking about how the month of ramadan is established on what grounds we say the month of, month of ramadan has started there are three ways in which the month of ramadan it can it is confirmed he says by biru'yatil hilal by looking at the 
crescent, the new moon. So this ba is sababi. It is for the reason that it is with the sabab of the uh, sighting of the crescent, the month of Ramadan, it begins. So first one, by looking at the crescent. Second one is the 30, if the 30 days of Shaban, they complete, then this also means the next, that the, the next day will be first of Ramadan. And the third one will come a little later. The author will talk about it. He says, be ruyati, be ruyati hilali walau min adalin. Be ruyati hilalin walau bi adalin. This is a very important point which the author is pointing to it. That the month of Ramadan, beginning of the month of Ramadan is established with the sighting of the crescent, the new moon. Okay. Why? Because Allah says, Faman shahid amin shahara fal yasumu, that whoever amongst you witnesses the month of Ramadan, then let him fast. He should fast it. So, and also Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sumu li ruyatihi wa aftiru li ruyatihi fast by sighting the new moon and break your fast, which means end the month of Ramadan by sighting the moon of Shawwal. So, this is the first one. Walau min adlin, walau min adlin, which means as against every other month. In order to, to establish the beginning of the months, the Islamic months, you need to have witness from two righteous, upright people. Two upright people should give witness that, yes, we have sighted the moon. As against the beginning of month of Ramadan, wherein two men are not needed. Only witness from a one single person will suffice. This is specific to the uh, beginning of the month. Because this is what has been reported from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu that one person is enough and this one person is not, it is not again not a condition that he should be a, a, a male only. Even one woman, one slave, even if they will uh, give the witness that yes we have sighted the moon, then this is more than enough. Uh, you don't need a witness from uh, two people. So this is concerning the beginning of the month by sighting the new moon. The second one the author is saying. Uh, you know, we said there are three ways in which we establish the beginning of the month of Ramadan. The first one is by sighting the new moon. The second one is Aw bi ikmali shabana. Aw bi ikmali shabana. If shaban, the month of shaban, can, completes 30 days, which means the next month day is the first of Ramadan. Because uh, in the Islamic calendar, you don't have, uh, either you have 29 days or 30 days. You cannot have a month with 28 days. Likewise, you cannot have a month with uh, 31 days. So when the Shaban completes 30 days, you don't need to even look for the new crescent. Definitely the next day is going to be the first of Ramadan. Even if you don't sight it, even if you don't sight new moon, then also the next day is going to be first of Ramadan. And then he says the third way, you know, uh, the third type, the third way in which this happens is, Musannif Rahimullah is saying that it may happen that on the 30th or on the, you know, like when it when the sun sets on the 29th of Shaban, then it will be 30th. Uh, either it will be 30th of Shaban or it will be 1st of Ramadan if the moon is sighted. But due to clouds or due to a mountain or due to haze or due to sandstorm or anything which prevents you know or anything which comes between you and the sighting of the moon then what is to be done according to the hanabila what is to be done uh, hanabila they say that the next day if there is if there are clouds if there is haze if there is rain going on and you are not able to sight the moon according to the hanabila rahimahullah they say next day you have to fast as a precaution why because they say it is possible that the moon was sighted and you did not see it. So in order to not miss that day, they, they, they recommend and it is like, they recommend that it is better to fast the next day with the intention of it being the Ramadan, first of Ramadan. However, there are many ulama, the many scholars of the past and the present, they say that it is not permissible to fast on this day because according to them, this day is known as Yav Mushak. It is, this is the day of doubt. And it is not permissible to fast on the day of doubt because of clear ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ wherein he has mentioned and he has mentioned that it is impermissible to fast on the day of doubt. However, as I said, in the mazhab, uh, the companions of Imam Ahmad, they say it is obligatory to fast on this day, which is like 
the when the moon was not sighted because of clouds or haze or things of that nature which prevented the sighting of the new crescent it is obligatory to fast however as i said the correct opinion concerning this matter is that a person should not fast on this day make 30 days of shaban complete and later they can see uh, how many days they are fasting in the month of ramzan if the ramzan ends in 28 days then definitely they miss this one day and they have to make it up later but they are excused for it because you know they could not see for a reason they could not see for a reason which was not under their control so they have to make up for this fast after the day of eid because they fasted one day less in the month but if ramzan is like 29 days then there is nothing because a month can be 29 or 30 days so there is no problem in it then the musannif rahimahullah he says wa in ru'iya naharan fa huwa lil muqbila sometimes it happens that the hilal the new crescent is sighted in the daytime not in the uh, it was not sighted in the night okay after the sunset the crescent was not sighted in the uh, after the sunset but it was sighted some somewhere in the daytime before zawal or after zawal it doesn't matter so this moon is for which day is it for the previous day or for the next day so the musannif rahimullah he is saying that if a moon is sighted in the daytime be it before zawal or the af- or after the zawal uh, then this crescent has to be considered for the past night it has to be considered for the past night which means that this day has to be considered from ramadan this day and it has to be considered from the past and uh, not for the next day and hence they say that al hilal that this crescent uh, it should not be considered uh, in sharia uh, to have been sighted actually because this was sighted in the daytime and again there is a bit difference of opinion amongst the scholars that if it is sighted in the daytime whether we should consider it for this day or the one which uh, which went past okay so this is what a small point which he is alluding to it yes please Facebook, Facebook. Jazak Allah khair, Barak Allah khair. Okay. So the author has now started talking about uh, that. What is what will be the case of those who are not actually? Uh, I mean, the fasting was not obligatory upon them initially, but during the <clears throat> daytime, they became of those upon whom the fasting is obligatory. so what is the case concerning these people so he says wa in sar ahlan li wujubihi fa fi asnaihi okay during the day now we we you know a little while ago we studied that every muslim it is obligatory upon him to fast okay and uh, he should be qadir he should be mukallaf these are the three and we said mukallaf you can divide it into a uh, two and it is like branch out into two so you have muslim baligh aqil qadir these are the four qualities these four qualities when they are found in any one then the fasting it is obligatory upon such a person so for example when we say muslim it means a person was kafir but this person he accepted islam for example on the like third of ramadan in the day time this person accepted islam for example on the 3rd of ramadan after say zawal so now this person has become now the now this fasting of ramadan become obligatory upon him the moment he accepted islam he entered into the fold of islam now the sharia is addressing him and fasting has become obligatory upon him so this is what is meant by the person becomes a person upon whom uh, fasting becomes obligatory during the uh, time of ramadan or the month of ramadan itself so what he has to do this is what is being discussed here so as i said in example a person this first person who was not a muslim then allah guided him and he entered into the fold of islam 
in the month of Ramadan itself, for example. First person. Second person, as I said, Baliq. He was a small child. Like, he was a child who has not yet reached the age of, he has not yet become an adult. But during the daytime, this child, he became an adult. Okay, with one of those signs, which we discussed earlier. Normally, these signs of Buluq are discussed in the uh, Kitabul, uh, Kitabul Hajr, which is like, which is discussed in the books of, uh, or the fiqh of uh, business transactions. So this person, he became, uh, like he became adult in the daytime. Now, the, he, he became among, he, he became of those upon whom fasting is obligatory. Third person, he was majnoon, for example. He was insane, but somehow Allah gave him sanity and he uh, gained his sanity and he, be, he no longer remained a madman. So this person also now, it, it, become, it became obligatory upon him to fast. Likewise, Qadir. Qadir, which means he was sick in the, you know, like uh, in the month of Ramadan, he was sick, but Allah gave him recovery. He, he gained his health and now uh, he is no longer sick. So, what is the case concerning these people? Likewise, the author is now saying, or he was traveling, he was a traveler, and we'll study a little later with, for a traveler, what is uh, better in his right, to fast or not to fast. But uh, the scholars, they say for a traveler, uh, he has, Allah has given him concession to not fast while he's traveling. Even if this travel has no mashakka, no hardship, even if there is no hardship, then also, uh, a traveler is, it is uh, better for him not to fast. He can, uh, you know, he can uh, leave the fast and make it up later because this is the concession which Allah has granted him. So if this traveler, he arrives in his home city in the daytime in Ramadan. Likewise, a woman, she becomes pure after her menses. So in the daytime of Ramadan, for example. Then what is obligatory upon all these people which we talked about? The author is saying, Am siku waqadaw which means the moment they became of those upon whom fasting has become obligatory, they became of those people, at any point in time, in the daytime of Ramadan, they have to stop eating, drinking, and doing all those things which nullify the fast. Number one, amsiku. Number two, akadaw. Amsaku, akadaw, which means they will hold back, restrain themselves from eating, drinking, and doing all those things which nullify the fast. Number two, they have to make it up later. These are the two rulings concerning these people which we talked about. However, again, there is a big debate amongst the scholars concerning uh, whether they will make it up later or not. Whether these people have to make it, make it up later or not. So scholars are like divided amongst uh, opinions, but they say that, for example, you know, <clears throat> those, uh, the first three or first four type that we talked about, uh, a kafir who accepted Islam or a young boy, a young child who uh, became an adult or uh, a majnoon who, is, who gained his sanity uh, as well as the uh, marees who became qadir, who uh, regained his health. So these four people, uh, they will restrain from eating and drinking for the remainder of the day and they need not to make up later. This is an opinion amongst the scholars and a very strong opinion amongst the a group of scholars who say that they need not to make it up later. Why? Because the Sharia has not come to command them with the same ibadat, ibadah two times. Uh, once they are, now the moment they became uh, of those people upon whom fasting is obligatory, so they restrained from doing all those things, eating, drinking and everything in the daytime of Ramadan. Now again, you will ask them to make it up later. So they say that this is something which is which the Sharia has not come actually with. They Sharia only asked them to do it once. In the earlier part of the day, they were not. It was not obligatory upon them to fast. But in the later part, uh, uh, they they become of those upon whom fasting is obligatory. So uh, they complied with it and they start stopped eating, drinking, and doing all those things which nullifies the fast. So that is more than enough for them, and they need not to come up later with their fasting. So this is an opinion again, as I said. We will not be going too uh, deep into this, into this issue. Then he says, okay, do you read this or you want to read that? Waman aftara, I think you read it, okay. Waman aftara liki barin, au maradin, la yurja bur uhu at amalikulli yaumin miskinan. Now, a person who, uh, you know, who uh, did not fast in the month of Ramadan, either because of 
likibarin, which means old age, or because of a sickness. Now, earlier one, we talked about the kind of sickness wherein it was hoped and expected that the person will recover. For such a person, uh, he has to make up for those fast later. Once he becomes, uh, gains his health, he has to make up for those fast. Now here we are talking about those people whose sickness is such that doctors say that uh, he will never regain health. There are kinds of sicknesses and diseases wherein the doctors say that it is not possible for them to ever recover from this sickness unless Allah gives them recovery, which is in the hands of Allah. But from the perspective of we human beings, doctors say, no, he, it is not possible for this person to regain health. So these are the two kinds of people. Number one, the one who has grown too old. Now, uh, the more he, you know, like the more he grows older, the more weaker he'll become. There is no possibility of this person to regain health and strength. So this person did not fast in the month of Ramadan because it is, he is too weak to fast. Number two, Marise, the sick person. The kind of sick, per, sick person who it is not expected and hoped that he will ever recover. What he has to do if he is not fasting in the month of Ramadan? At amali kulli yawmin miskinan. For each, each day of fasting, which he did not fast, he has to feed one miskin, one poor person. One poor person he will feed. How much to feed? The Hanabila they say, one mud, one mud of wheat or half sa, half sa, one mud is like one palm full. If you combine your two palms and then you insert it in any of the food item in order to fill that palm with it, for example, wheat or whatever, then this one hand uh, palm full of thing is known as one mud, one mud. And four mudud, like four palm full of anything, it makes up one sa. And this sa is actually a volumetric measurement. It is not uh, weight. It is not like in kilograms. It is just like the way you purchase milk, which is not uh, 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 this uh, weight measurement. Rather, it is volumetric measurement. So likewise, this sa is volumetric measurement. Therefore, no two items will weigh exactly the same. If you like uh, measure wheat, one sa, and it, then you measure uh, one sa of rice, the weight will differ between the two. And this is the reason the scholars have differed greatly concerning how much one sa is when you normally give uh, zakatul fitr and this disagreement it comes because of this issue they, that that this sa is a volumetric measurement and it is not weight and hence whatever item you will measure the weight of it is going to differ so the author is saying at ama likulli yawmin miskin and for each day of fasting which he has missed in the month of ramzan for example if he did not fast for 29 days because the month of ramzan was 29 days so this person will feed 29 masakin now, either he can feed each day, each day, you know, like uh, every day he will ask one, uh, this miskin will give him the food or at the end of the month also he can call 30 miskin or 29 depending on the month, the, the, uh, uh, the days in the month and he'll feed them all together. This is what Anas ibn Malik who used to do when he grew old and it became impossible for him to fast because of his old age because Prophet made dua for him. It's applicated in his favor. And uh, he lived a long age and he had many children. So he would do what he would do. He would call 30 or 29 miskin at the end of the month and he will feed all of them at once. So this is also it can be done. So in favor of these two kind of people, a person who has grown old or a person who is sick such that it is not hope that he will recover ever from this disease, then they will feed uh, one miskin for each day of fasting which they missed. How much to give? How much to feed? As I said, one mud, one mud, which means one palm full of wheat, or two mud, which is half sa, because I said four sa, four mud is one sa, so two mud is half sa. So Hanabila they say one mud of wheat or two mud of anything other than wheat, which could be local food which is eaten in that country. It could be rice. Earlier days it was like raisins, it was like cheese or paneer such kind of things in the olden days, uh, barley, and such kind of things. But now the authors, they say, because nobody in present times eat raisins, nobody uh, as main food eats uh, cheese or paneer. So what to do? Give what the people eat in your place. What is like normally uh, is their food item. And majority of the people, uh, they prefer to eat either. Wheat is always a item which normally everyone eats. But other than that, rice. So if you are giving rice, then two mud, which is half a sa, 
or if you're giving wheat, then it is one mud. How much is uh, approximately half sa? They say one sa is close to two kilograms, two and a half kilograms approximately. Two, there are some scholars who uh, you know went up to even three kilograms. So half of it is like one and a half kilograms. Half a sa is one and a half kilograms, and one mud is uh, like 750 grams to around 800 or 900 grams. So this is what a person either he can give this uncooked form, or he can call uh, one miskin for each day towards uh, at the end of the month, and he'll feed all of them uh, to their fill. Then he says, "Wasun al fitru li maridin yashuk walehi wa musafirin yaksuru." Now. In whose right it is masnoon, it is recommended to not fast. Who are those wherein the Sharia has given them concession? And in fact, it is sunnah, it is masnoon for them not to fast. So there are two kinds of people. Li maridin alayhi, wa musafirin yaksuru. So this marid here is the marid, not this one, which we talked earlier, which is uh, who, who is sick such that it is not hoped, his recovery is not hoped at all. No, we are not talking about this marid now. This marid is someone where you know he it is expected and it is hoped that this person will recover but if he fast in the month of ramadan the doctors say that if he fasts in the month of ramadan then either it will increase his sickness number one number two either it will delay his recovery or number three it may lead to some new sickness uh, coming into this person when one of these three things are likely or possible in this person then the doctors they, they say or the sharia it says that such a person we say that it is difficult for him to fast and then what to do it is recommended for this person to not fast it is recommended for this person to not fast we are not talking about just a small bruise or a cut in the finger and he says i am sick or just a small fever or cough or cold and he says no i cannot fast no we are not i, I gave you the criteria the three conditions number one if this person fast because of this fasting, if it is, uh, it will increase this person's existing sickness. Number one. Number two, it uh, it delays the recovery. Number three, it gives rise to additional pain or new kind of sickness. Then only this person is excused from fasting, and in fact, uh, it will be said to them that it is in your right, it is must known, and it is highly recommended that you do not fast and you make up for these days later when you recover from your illness. This is first one. Second one, wa musafirin yaksur, a traveler, yaksur, which means a qasr salah. This person is traveling a distance or uh, which is more than 80 kilometers because after this distance, it becomes permissible for this person who is a traveler to seek concessions of travel, which are like shorten the prayers, which are like uh, wiping over the socks for three days and three nights. So uh, uh, combining the prayers. So these things, they become permissible for this person who is traveling more than a distance of 80 kilometers. So for this person also, it is recommended to not fast. Even if the traveling is full of comfort, the person is traveling in aeroplane from one place to another, there is no hardship. Even in, uh, in the right of this person, it is uh, sunnah for this person to not fast. Because Prophet Salaam gave that condition. But again, the scholars, they say, whatever is more beneficial and easy for this person he should do if uh, it is easier for him to make up for this fast later then in his right it is more preferable for him not to fast in ramadan because allah has already given him concession but if he feels that uh, later it will become difficult for him to fast because when everyone is fasting in the month of ramadan or whole family all the muslims they are fasting then it is easier everyone is fasting so along with them the fast becomes easier so he is traveler but if he feels that it is easy for him to fast along with others, other Muslims and relatives and friends, then in his right, it is better for him to fast uh, and not to uh, like uh, leave this fast and make it up later because it may become difficult for this person to fast later alone, wherein the family members are eating and then he'll be fasting on those days. So scholars have made this differentiation, but in the mazhab, they say mutlakan, absolutely for a musafir, irrespective of uh, whether the travel has mashakka, difficulty or not, this traveler will uh, not fast in the month of Ramadan and then he will make it up later after the days of Eid. Wallahu alam. Okay, yes, please. Uh, 
همین رو فایده پس بک پس بک و این افتر و این افترت حامل او مردیون خوفن علا انفسی هیما قد تا فقط او علا ولده هیما مع الاتعامی ممن یمونو الولد now this is an issue concerning a woman who is pregnant or a woman who is breastfeeding the child both these women if they are afraid of themselves like if they fast they feel danger for their own life both a pregnant woman as well as the one who is breastfeeding the child if they are afraid of their own lives that if they fast the doctor says that if you'll fast you know there is danger to for your life be it hamil or murdera then what they have to do they will not fast during that period in ramadan and they will make it up both of them will make it up later whenever it is safe for them to make up a, a, a pregnant woman will make it up once he Uh, delivers the baby and a murde will make it up once the period of breastfeeding ends so they both them both of them have to make it up only this faqat which means if they are afraid of their own lives and they leave the fasting because of the fear for their own selves then they will the only thing that they have to do is to make up for the missed fasts later but aw ala waladaihima but if they are afraid of not for their own self but for the sake of their child for this hamil she is afraid of the child which is in the womb or this breastfeeding woman is afraid of the child who she is breastfeeding that some harm may happen to her if i don't eat milk may not come or if i don't eat the child will be in danger in the womb if they feel that and if the doctor says that yes there is harm in that then these women are allowed not to fast they leave the fasting later they have to do two things number one definitely they have to make up for the fast which they have not fasted even it it is for the sake of this child along with it they will feed one miskin for every day of the every day of fasting which they did not fast each day which they did not fast they have to feed one miskin how much we already saw uh, one mud of wheat or two mud or half sa of anything other than wheat but the responsibility of this feeding is upon whom mimman yamunul walad the one who is the in charge of the this child either it could be father or any guardian or a wakil whoever is responsible for this child it is upon him to feed one miskin for each day of the fast this woman did not fast for the sake of the uh, for the sake of this child this is what is mean here tam barakallahuk Hasbuk, Hasbuk. Okay. Now the author says there are some more categories of people, which he is discussing. That what is the fast concerning these people? Waman ugmi alaihi, au junna jami an nahari. These are the first two kind of people. The one, for example, he became unconscious. Waman ugmi alai. Or junna jami an nahar. There is a person who is not like uh, he doesn't get these fits or. he is not always mad but sometimes he get those kind of fits wherein he loses his mind completely he loses the sanity completely so what is the fasting of these kind of people he says man ugmi alaihi aw junna jami an nahar like the one who is unconscious for the whole day he became unconscious like before the salatul fajr a person became unconscious before salatul fajr or the person or this person became uh he became insane before salatul fajr and they remained in this situation all through the day until after the sunset and after sunset they, he gained consciousness and the other person he gained his sanity so what is the status of their fasting the author says lam yasi hasamuhu fasting of both these person is not correct why because niya niya is not there the niya is missing there is no niya however there is difference they are differentiating between the one who became unconscious and the one who lost the mind completely because the one who lost the mind completely the one who became insane he lost the niya there is no niya for such a person and when there is no niya this person is not actually addressed by the sharia we studied earlier 
when I told you that the pen has been lifted from three kind of people. The one of them is Majnoon. One is a Sagir, a small child. The other one is Majnoon. So when the pen of obligation is lifted, which means the fasting is not obligatory, not at all obligatory upon this person who has lost his mind. Contrary to the one who became unconscious, this person is not like the mad person. He just lost his sense temporarily. His mind is with him, but he became unconscious. So the one who became unconscious, it is obligatory upon him to make up for this fast because he was addressed by the Sharia as against the Majnoon who lost his sanity and hence he is not addressed by the Sharia at all because the moment he lost his mind, the pen has been lifted from him. And when the pen has been lifted from him, he is not asked to make up for that day. This is what is being said here. Then he says, mufardin illa bi niyatin mu'ayyanatin bi juz in min al -layli. Now this is, a, this is a very important issue concerning the niya, the intention of fasting. Uh, especially the fasting Saumu Faradin. Saumu Faradin means the obligatory fast. This obligatory fast, it includes a few things. Number one, it includes the fasting of Ramadan. It includes the fast because fasting of Ramadan, Ramadan is obligatory. Also, the fasting of Nazar. When somebody takes a vow to fast a day, then he is actually making that thing obligatory upon himself. Sharia did not make it obligatory upon him. But this person, he made it obligatory upon himself. This person made it obligatory upon himself. So, so what is to be done in that case? Likewise, the makeup fast, a person who did not fast the month of Ramzan, either because, uh, because of sickness or because of traveling, then this person also has to make up the fast later after Eid. You know, then he has one full year to make up for those missed fasts. So this fast is also like the further fast for him. So in all these cases, which is the fasting of Ramadan, a person when he's fasting in the month of Ramadan, number two, uh, the fasting of Nazar, somebody made Nazar that I will fast one day, uh, for example, for the sake of Allah, Lillahi. this person and number three, the one who is making up the missed fast, making up the missed fast later. Then in, these, in the case of these three people, these three kind of people, it is obligatory that they should come up with the Niyya, they should come up with the intention before they begin in the fasting, which is before uh, the uh, Salatul Fajr or before the Azan of the Fajr. They should come up with the Niyya. It is not permissible for them to fast without having the Niyya. And Niyya is very important uh, in every Ibadah in Islam. Niyya is very important. Without Niyya, the Niyya is the thing. Intention is the thing which differentiates an Ibadah from an Ada. It differentiates worship from habit, uh, a habitual activity, like two people, they are fasting or they are not eating something. One of them is not eating for the sake of dieting. The other one is not eating for the sake of, as an ibadah, for the sake of pleasing Allah. The one who is fasting, not eating or drinking or doing all those things which invalidate the fast for the sake of Allah, then this is fast. It will be considered and accepted as a fast in the sight of Allah. While the one who is not eating and drinking and not doing all those things which invalidate fast just for the sake of dieting then this person, this will not be considered a valid fast. He will not be rewarded upon uh, abstaining from eating, drink, drinking and doing all those things. He will not be rewarded upon that. So the thing which differentiates between an ada, a habitual activity and ibadah, a worship is the niya. So intention has to be there and especially for the further fasting, the fasting which is further. And as I said, these are three or four types of fasting. Fasting of Ramadan, Qada of Ramadan, Nazar, also Kaffara. You know, if there is kafara, what is it? We'll see a little later. There is, there, there are some details which are going to come for kafara. So these four kind of fasting, a person should intend about it, a, a fasting of these four kinds of fast before beginning into the fast, which is like before the true fajr, before the fajr as -sadi. He should have intention of fasting, but there are no specific words. There are no specific words for it. Rather, a person, when he wakes up for doing the sahur in the morning, then it itself is a niya. That why did he wake up at this part of uh, this part of the or early part of the morning? And who normally wakes up and eats at that part? Like at 4, 3.30 or 4 in the morning. And nobody eats at that time or drinks at that time. So his waking up and eating and drinking itself is a kind of a niya and that should suffice. So this is what is being uh, said. Here, some part of the night, in, like a person uh, before sleeping, he 
like play pray salatu tarawih and after praying salatu tarawih before sleeping he intends that tomorrow i am going to fast this will suffice and intention is in the heart likewise as i said the one who is waking up in the morning for taking the pre dawn meal then this is also a kind of a condition which will suffice for his fast and uh, you know the, the again there is difference of opinion amongst you know some some of the scholars they say that this uh, there are some scholars who say that the intention at the beginning of the month itself will suffice for the whole month like a person who intended to fast the whole month of ramadan at the beginning of it will suffice the problem comes when a person he is continues the fasting because of a valid shar'i reason like a person who became sick or a person who went on a travel on a journey so this person it is permissible for him to not fast when he is traveling he is on a journey so it is permissible for this person to not fast so when he comes back again now it is obligatory for this person to again renew the intention in the niya so this is where the scholars they have some uh, difference of opinion otherwise all of them are agreed that when it is the uh, when you are fasting a obligatory fast and obligatory fast are like or four things as nice i said fasting of ramadan number 1 making up the fast, the missed uh, fast of ramadan number 2 number 3 the fast of nazar and number 4 the fast of kafara in all these four cases you must intend before uh the uh, the azan of the uh, fajr then he says was asihu naflun mimman lam yaf'al mufsidan bi niyati bi niyatin naharan mutlaqan now this is the intention of the voluntary fasting as against the obligatory fasting like a person as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also did when you know one day he came uh, to the house of aisha radhiyallahu anha and he asked is there anything to eat and aisha radhiyallahu anha said no so he said so i am fasting which means in the afternoon or somewhere in the uh, before afternoon or near the afternoon time before or after the one it doesn't matter he came and then he found that there is nothing to eat so he said okay then in that case i am fasting so he intended fasting from the midday but the condition is mimman lam yaf'al mufsidan condition is that he should not have committed anything which are from the invalidators of fast if this is the case then he can intend to fast from any part of the day even if it is like 1 minute before the sunset but condition is that he should not have done anything which are considered from amongst the invalidators of fast bi yeah. niyatin niya is important with everything inna mal amalu bin niyat he has he should have the niya of fasting he should have the niya of uh, that the, that this fasting is an ibadah for the sake of allah he is doing it for the sake of allah so any in any part of the day if this person intended to fast provided he has not committed or done anything from amongst the invalidators of the fast then the fast of such a person is sahi mutlaqan it means that it doesn't matter whether he intended it before zawal or after zawal it doesn't matter if it is the nafl fast a voluntary fast then this person can intend it at any part of the day allah alam now Um, brother are you there Okay, I think he's not there. Let me read it out for you. First loan. Now there is new fasl. Waman adkhala ila jawfihi aw mujawfin fi jasadihi kademagin wa halqin shayan min ayi maudin min ayi maudin tan غير إهليله أو ابتلى عن خامة بعد وصولها إلى فمه أو استقاء أو استقاء فقاء أو استمنا أو باشر دون الفرج فأمنا أو أمزى أو كرر النظر فأمنا أو نوى الافتارة أو هجم أو يحتجم عامدا مختارا زاقرا لصومه أفطر. In this part, the author رحمه الله he has started talking about those things which invalidate a person's fast. So these are known as the مفطرات. Or mufsidatus saum, those things which invalidate the fast. 
okay and these are not the only things but here the musannif rahimahullah he mentioned seven of them this is a mukhtasar it is a summarized book you know this is the name is akhsar al mukhtasarat so it is already uh, the it is already mukhtasar it is already summarized and again he summarized even more so this is a very concise book not everything is being mentioned here so uh, the author will mention like seven of them seven things which uh, invalidate a person's uh, person's fast so he says the first one which is known to everyone is man adkhala ila jawfihi aw mujawwafin fi jasadihi like a person who enters anything into his stomach through the mouth anything a person who enters anything into his stomach like it is food and drink basically it is the most known and famous of the invalidators of fast which means entering anything into the stomach okay and this is what we call as uh, anything which like eating and drinking a person eats and drink and inserts anything into his stomach why because the because allah says in the quran wa kulu washrabu hatta yatabayyana lakum al khaytu al abyadu min al khayt al aswadi min al fajr thumma atimmu siyam walal atimmu siyama ila al layl so if you eat and drink so eating and drinking is haram in the day time of ramadan from the tulu or rising of the fajr from the true fajr until the sunset which means right before the azan of the fajr when the azan of the fajr is given from that time until the sunset it is prohibited for you to eat and drink so this the first thing is actually eating and drinking and this is something which is uh, there is a consensus of the scholars that if somebody eats and drinks his fast it becomes invalidated he says shay'an shay on anything anything if it reaches his throat or even if it reaches his uh, you know dimag its brain through the root of nose then that particular thing then because of it the fast becomes invalidated the fast will becomes uh, invalid because shay on when he says and the scholars they say when a uh, indefinite noun it comes in the context of shart istifham nahi or nafi which means condition interrogation prohibition uh, if it comes in any one of any one of these con uh, context if a nakira is some indefinite noun it comes in the context of one of these four things then it indicates generality which means anything anything even if it is something which you normally don't eat stones you you know eat it or you you know like smell something you know there are certain kinds of medicines which have to be like uh, sm smelled through by the root of nose so in that case it reaches the brain even that causes your fasting to become invalidated okay so these are the things which breaks or invalidate your fast likewise you know uh, uh, inserting something through the root of anus because there are certain kind of treatments wherein the medicine is pushed through the pa the uh, uh, part of anus so even that invalidates the fast even that thing it invalidates the fast of uh, of this person okay then he says uh, everything and basically uh, try to understand anything which enters your stomach or reaches your throat according to the hanabila it invalidates your fast this is the basic uh, you know like the foundational principle then he says uh, then the uh, the author rahimahullah he says uh uh Uh, okay then he says ghaira ihlilihi ghaira ihlil is actually the the urinary tract the urinary tract you know like uh, the pipe or the, the which is coming from the urethra outside through your penis which is the male organ there is a pipe okay which is known as this uh, urinary tract so if anything is inserted from the urinary tract anything inserted into the body then it doesn't invalidate the fast why because this is not actually the place of eating and drinking so that doesn't invalidate the fast but awi bitala nukhamatan like a cuff if it comes out and if this cuff it comes out if it is like if it doesn't comes to your mouth and it remains in the throat itself and then you swallow it then it doesn't invalidate your fast especially we are talking about the cuff Yeah, okay try to understand the cuff if it comes out into your mouth because there is another principle the mouth it takes the hukum of external mouth is external to your body mouth is considered to be external to your body so the moment this uh, cuff it comes out into your mouth and then you swallow it back then this invalidates your fast contrary to the cuff which doesn't come out to your mouth rather it is in your throat itself and then you swallow it back 
though you know from medical point of view to do it and not to do it is a different uh, issue we are talking about whether this invalidates the fast or not so if it is within the throat itself and you swallow it then it doesn't invalidate but the moment it comes out into the mouth upon the tongue and then you swallow it back then this is something which will invalidate your fast then he says avistaqa ufaqa the person who purposefully person who purposefully tries to vomit and because of it he vomits actually he tries to and he inserts the finger into the mouth and tries to vomit out the things from the stomach out then this also invalidates the fast contrary to the one who contrary to the one when the vomit came on its own without uh, like under uh, his control or her control then in that case it doesn't invalidate the fast but this person he tried to insert the finger into the mouth and then tries to vomit out the things then this is something which invalidates the fast of this person then he says avistamna avistamna is to uh, uh, you know like uh, what they call is this masturbation with one's own hand and because of it if uh, uh, because of doing this if money the sperm it comes out then this also invalidates the fast added to it it is definitely it is a sin so he has committed a sin but at the same time if a person he masturbates and because of which uh, sperm comes out and he ejaculates then this thing it invalidates this person's fast then he says au bashara duna farji fa amna bashara is like being intimate with one's wife to be to become intimate with one's wife without actually uh doing the act of intercourse without actually doing the jima without doing intercourse but just being intimate for play and because of it if this person ejaculates like uh if this person like ejaculates then this also invalidates the fast this also invalidates the fast because this is these issues are very dangerous especially the youth they should pay attention to it those you know uh, you know some teachers of mine they do explain these situations in quite great detail because those youth who got married just a month before ramadan they you know like they fall into such kind of issues they have to be extra careful so the person and the condition is see the inzal ejaculation must happen so in mubashara which means being uh, a person is getting intimate with his wife and if he ejaculates then only the uh, this fast becomes invalidated if he doesn't ejaculate then the fast will not become invalidated so the condition is he should ejaculate then he says uh, rahimahullah au amza likewise this issue is also very severe au amza amza means you know there is a fluid which comes out right before uh, the actual act of intercourse a small thin sticky fluid which comes out before the actual act of uh, intercourse so this fluid is also Uh, it invalidates the fast according to the hanabila rahimahumullah it invalidates so here see uh, the author is uh, you know like he is talking all those things which invalidate a person's fast so if these things can invalidate a person's fast then jima which is the actual uh, intercourse even more so it is definitely going to and the issue of jima is so severe that a majority of the almost all the uh, fuqaha those who have written the books of fiqh uh they mention the issue of jima separately they don't mention it among along other invalidators why because the case of jima is very severe uh, it, it will come a little later but anyway the au amza which means this uh, what they call maybe this prostatic fluid or something which is a kind of thin a sticky fluid which comes just before the actual uh, act of uh, intercourse so this also according to the hanabila it invalidates the fast so one has to be very careful though according to the majority of opinion it doesn't invalidate this madi madi it doesn't invalidate because there are uh, you know like three or four things which comes come out from the uh, male private part one of them is urine urine does not invalidate fast the other one is uh, uh, this uh, sperm which is money it it invalidates the fast likewise mazi uh, uh, in the mazhab it invalidates the fast and then there is something which is known as wadi wadi and it is like uh, uh, again it is uh, like uh, a sticky fluid which comes normally before or after urinating and this normally happens because of some kind of disease and it also doesn't invalidate uh, your fast but according to the mazhab ejaculation of sperm or this mazi it invalidates the fast 
او کرر نظر فامنا اور ریپیٹیڈلی لکنگ ایٹ سم ون لائک اے پرسن ہی لکس ایٹ ہز وائف ریپیٹیڈلی اینڈ بیکاز آف ایٹ اف ہی ایجاکولیٹ دین ہز فاسٹ بیکم becomes invalidated so again the condition is he should ejaculate if he doesn't ejaculate because of repeatedly looking at one's wife then it will not invalidate but again the person has to be very careful this is very rare normally it doesn't happen that you look at someone and then you ejaculate uh, unless it is due to some kind of illness but it may happen in certain individuals uh, like uh, uh, who get stimulated very quickly so Uh, in such cases it may be possible but this is the reason the ulama the scholars they mention it so repeatedly looking at one's wife if a person because of it ejaculates then the fast becomes invalidated aw nawal iftar or a person who he intends to break the fast even if he doesn't break it by eating and drinking just mere intending that like he is no more fasting after like midday he said no i am not fasting his fast invalidates just because of this intention even though he did not commit anything any of these previous things which we talked earlier he did not commit any of these things despite this his fast will become invalid just because of intending to break the fast aw hajama aw ihtajama or the person who is doing hijama okay the person who is doing hijama which is to uh, like uh, take out the you uh, know this blood from the body of a person which is a known procedure all of you must be aware of it this hijama it uh, invalidates the fast the one who is doing his fast becomes invalidated as well as the one who gets the hijama done on whose body hijama is being done the fast of both these person becomes invalidated but again there is difference of opinion amongst the scholars uh, there are some who says that it doesn't invalidate uh, because the ruling was related to uh, in 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 the right of one who is getting hijama done on his body the scholars they said because you know when you are uh, taking the blood out this person he uh, is going to become weak so because of that the scholars they say the one who has done hijama his fast becomes invalidated as for the one who is doing hijama who the one who is doing the hijama then he, why his fast becomes invalidated because in the olden days they used to uh, suck the blood with their mouth the vacuum was there were no you know these suction cups were not there at that time they used to do it with their own mouth so there were chances of this blood entering into their mouth and hence they say the this hajim the one who is doing the hijama his fast also becomes invalidated uh, but you know like as i said there is difference of opinion amongst the scholars but there are there are some who say that it doesn't for both of them like the one who is doing hijama the one upon whom the hijama is done it doesn't invalidate the fast in allah alam then he says amidan mukhtaran zakiran li saumihi these are the three conditions amidan knowingly this person is committing any of these seven things which we discussed knowingly he commits one of these seven things mukhtaran by choice not forced or compelled zakiran which means not forgetfully if somebody eats or drinks uh, or does any of these things forgetfully except for jima we'll talk about that that rule this is the reason author has not discussed jima here in these uh, uh, invalidators because in there uh, in jima they say even if like Uh, like it cannot be thought of a person is compelled to do, to to do jima you cannot think about it so even if somebody says no i was forced or i forgot no it doesn't matter you did it in the month of ramadan so your fast becomes invalidated and there is a kafara upon you so regarding these seven things which we discussed if he commits them knowingly by choice not compelled and not forgetfully then then this person his fast becomes invalidated so the khabar is aftara in all of these cases the fast of this person becomes invalidated what he has to do he has to repent and then he has to make it up later after the uh, after the eid okay brother if you are there please read barak okay so now here the author is uh, saying now we said that uh, you know there are like four or five different uh, cases wherein something comes out from your private part either it is because of jima or it either it was because of uh, mubashara which is like being intimate or because of repeatedly looking at someone like your wife or because of uh, you know as we said uh, repeatedly looking at someone or uh masturbation but there is one more case wherein a person may ejaculate which is by simply 
like thinking about something. A person keeps thinking about something uh, erotic, and because of it, this person ejaculates. So because of it, the fast doesn't be it doesn't become invalidated. Fast doesn't become invalidated if a person ejaculates just on the grounds of thinking and imagination. Okay, because it it is not under his control. This imagination is not under his control. So because of it, uh, ulama rahimahumullah they say the fast doesn't become invalidated. La in fakkara fanzal. This is what is mean by it. Aw dakhala ma amad madatin aw istin shaqin halkahu or uh, water from rinsing the mouth madmada ma u madmadatin aw istin shaqin. Istin shaq is to take the water up through uh, nose. To clean the nose and then push it out through the nose itself. Sometimes it happens that a person, you know, while doing the madmada, which is rinsing the mouth or taking into the uh, this water into the nose, it happens without his, without he actually intending. Water goes down the throat. So the author is saying this also does not invalidate the fast. Why? Because normally he doesn't intend to take the water through these roots into the mouth. Just because he's cleaning his uh, mouth and nose. Some water it goes down the throat because it is not possible to like you know rinse the water out completely hundred percent. Definitely there will be some drops of water which would be on tongue which are going to go down the throat. Likewise, doing a thin shark, it is very difficult to you know like uh, take care of this water which one has taken into their nose to avoid it going down the throat. It is very 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 difficult. So Sharia has not come to make things difficult for us. So if a person mistakenly uh, he takes this water of rinsing or the stin shark water into his throat, it doesn't invalidate the fast. Likewise, even even if he like he uh, he did too much, he did too much in rinsing the mouth or he did too much uh, by pulling the water into the nose. He, he went some, you know, like an extra mile in doing those things, cleaning the mouth or doing his thin shark. Even if he does that and Roger water reaches the throat, then also the fast doesn't become invalidated. Or this person, he rinsed the mouth more than three times. Rinsed the mouth more than three times. Then also it doesn't invalidate his fast. Okay, but a person should be very careful, especially in the month of Ramadan, to not, uh, you know, like uh, do rinsing of the mouth more than what is required or not to pull the water more than what is required through the nose. Because these are the things which are, like, you know, a bit dangerous if they go inside, because there is again difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Okay, brother. Okay, read the next one also. Has book Barakullah of it. So now the author is separately discussing the issue of uh, uh, this uh, sexual intercourse during the daytime of Ramadan. As I said, this is something, this is a matter which is very serious. And hence, almost all those who are who have written the books of fiqh, they always mention the topic of jima during Ramadan separately. It is also an invalidator of fast. But if you would have noticed, the author did not talk about it along with those seven because the ruling concerning those seven is different and this one is different. Though both of them invalidate the fast, but there is something more to it. When somebody does jima in the daytime of Ramadan, there is something more to it and this is kafara. So he says, Waman abi Ramadana, the one who does intercourse during the daytime of Ramadan, bi Ramadana, naharan, these are the conditions. Number two, it should be in the month of Ramadan, again in the daytime of Ramadan, not the night time. So, this shows that if somebody does intercourse while he is making up the fast later, see, for example, a person, he did not fast one day because maybe he was sick or he was a traveler. So, he did not fast one day. Now, he has to make up for this fast after Eid in the month of Shammal or whenever he gets the time and opportunity. During that make-up fast, if he commits intercourse, then, then what? Then in that case, there is no kafara. He only has to make up for that fast. Why? Because this ruling of kafara is specific with naharan, bi Ramadan, naharan, in the daytime of Ramadan. 
okay so he says manjama bi ramadan naharan day time of ramadan bila huzri shabaqin wa nahwi shabaq is it is like a person who is uh, like uh, who has too many desires whose desires are too much and there is nothing which can prevent this man if he doesn't do it he may you know fall into some kind of harm doctor say that you have to do it without it you cannot survive so for this person it is allowed to do even in the day time of and there are certain such kind of people they do exist they do exist so for such kind of people sharia has given them the concession but with the condition that if there is an alternative by which they can you know like satisfy their desires without doing the jima then they should try to first do it with that without even you know going to this stage if it is possible to pacify and satisfy the desires with some other means try to adopt them but if it fails then only it is permissible for these people to fulfill their desires by jima and for such people there is no kafara for them okay but they will have to make up for the fast in any case fa alayhi al qada wal kafaratu mutlaqan then upon them is what number 1 qada and there is kafara upon them there is kafara is an expiation for this uh, fasting which they have done uh, for, for this fast which they uh, invalidated so there is a kafara and what is the kafara it will come a little later uh, inshallah that what that kafara is and what is to be given how to do this all these things inshallah will come a little later then he says wala kafara ta alayha ma al uzri now there are two people involved in this act okay like husband and wife male and female so here we talked about the male this this is about the male as well as you can also consider it for the female also if she is doing it out of her own will so this is for both but now this is specific to the female la kafara ta alayha ma al uzri there is no kafara upon the female with the uzr with an excuse now what is this excuse this excuse is like kanaumi like she was sleeping and this uh, husband came and uh, forcefully he did it so she was sleeping she wasn't aware of it wa ikrahi or she is forced you have to do it if you don't do maybe like i'll divorce you she is forced aw wa nisyanin she forgot she is fasting she forgot aw jahil or she was ignorant she was ignorant then in all such cases there is only qada there is only make up upon this woman okay there is no kafara upon her there is no expiation upon her uh this is when like she is not involved this act with his own desire but if she is involved in this act with her desire that kafara becomes applicable upon both of them they have to give the kafara naam Now, now he is telling you the what is the expiation for uh, for this sin? The one who committed uh, sexual intercourse during the day time of Ramadan, then what is the expiation for it? So the author is saying, for here, it who rakabatin free a slave, and this is in this order only. It is not upon choice. So this is not upon takhir. okay this is not upon takhir like you have a choice either do this or this or this no you have to go in this order first you have to find out if it, is it possible for you to free a slave a believing slave it quraqabatin if it is possible do it in present times it is not possible you don't have this system of slavery so fa illam yajid so if you don't find a slave to free or you don't have that much money to free a slave what to do fa siyamu shahrayni mutataviyayni you have to fast continuously and consecutively for two months two lunar months now this lunar months could be like uh like both the months are like 29 days so 58 days one has to fast or one of them is 29 and other is 30 so it is 59 days or both of them are 30 days so it is 60 days so between 58 to 60 days this person has to fast continuously without any gaps except for example if she, she is a woman then uh, her you know like 6 7 days in a month she is allowed that doesn't like uh, cause a break in between and this is considered and considered an uzr for her in her case likewise for a man like if it is the day of eid uh, eid ul fitr so on that day he cannot fast so for example he fasted like 25 days and then after it eid came or you know like let us say eid ul adha eid ul adha came he started fasting after 25 days of fasting eid ul adha came 
So he will not fast on the 10th of Zulhij, then 11, 12th and 13th. Four days he is allowed to take a break. Why? Because these are the four days when it is impermissible. It is haram for a person or Muslim to fast on these four days. On the 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th of Zilhij. So he can take a break. But if he is like he took a break in between for no valid reason. Like he fasted for 50 days. And then he did not fast for no reason. Then the counting will start again from one the next day. Why? Because he did not. He took a break without any valid Sharai reason. So this is very severe. Like he fasted for 50 days. Then he did not fast one day. And then what will happen? Again, the, the counter will reset. And he'll again fast from one day, another two months. So, fasiyamu shaharaini mutataviyaini. Fa illam yastati. And if he is like, doctor says that, no, you cannot fast two months continuously. If you do that, you know, like, uh, you may die. Or some kind of sickness will develop into you. It will cause further problems to you. So, what to do? Fa illam yastati. Fa itamu sittina miskin. And then this person has to feed 60 poor miskin people. How much? The same one which we talked earlier. One mood of wheat. Or two mod or half a saf, anything other than wheat. Fa illam yajid, if he cannot even find this very poor person, uh, he has no money to free a slave, he is very weak, he cannot fast. Doctor says you cannot fast. He doesn't even have money to feed 60 poor people. What to do? Waved off. This kafara is waved off because of a hadith in this matter which is present that a man came to the Prophet and he complained that, oh, oh Rasulullah, I am destroyed. How destroyed Prophet Salaam, what did you do? He said, I committed uh, intercourse with my wife during the daytime of Ramadan. Then Prophet Salaam asked him these things only. Do you have money to free a slave? He said, no. Can you fast 60 days? He said, no, I cannot fast continuously, consecutively for 60 days. Then he says, then feed 60 poor people. He said, I cannot do even, I don't have money to fast, to feed 60 poor people. Then a basket full of tamr, dates came to the Prophet Salaam. Prophet Salaam gave it to him and he said, okay, give it to the miskin people. He said, I don't know who is more poor than me between these two mountains of Medina. And he, there is no one more poorer than me. Then Prophet Salaam laughed and said, okay, keep it with you and eat it. So this shows that this kafara uh, of this expiation, if somebody is incapable of uh, fulfilling this expiation, then it is waved off from him. Allahu alam. Okay. Rika Poblato. Damn. So now he will talk about the disliked acts. What are the things which are disliked, which are makro to be done while a person is in the state of or while he is fasting? So he says, which means to gather the saliva in one's mouth and then swallow it down the throat. This is something which is disliked, but it doesn't invalidate the fast, which we must know. Sometimes we keep on spitting out. This is something which is not required at all. This is natural. It generates in your mouth naturally. You cannot avoid that. Saliva, you cannot avoid the generation of saliva in your mouth. So, generation of saliva naturally, and then it going down the throat, it is not even makru. But here he is specifically talking about gathering it in the mouth, collecting it in the mouth, and then swallowing it down the throat is something which is makru, but it doesn't invalidate the fast. Likewise, tasting the food. This is specifically in case of women, those who want to taste the salt and uh, spices in the food. Uh, then this is something which is allowed, but again, the condition is nothing should go down the throat. And tasting normally, it happens or you do it with the tongue, because the tongue has the taste buds. So just putting some food on the tongue and then uh, spit it out is something which is which is okay but you know this is only you know if somebody does it without any need then this is dislike but if there is a real need of tasting the food wherein a woman knows that if I don't do it and if salt and spices if they become you know like more or less then the husband is going to shout or things are going to take bad turn then in that case the karahite goes away 
because there is an ozer for doing that but if there is no ozer unnecessarily someone is trying to taste the food then this is something which is disliked but it doesn't invalidate the that means i think the microphone it got disconnected in between so anyway i was saying that tasting a food is something which is normally allowed in case of a need but if there is no need a person is tasting the food without any need then this is something which is disliked wa madghu ilqin la yatahallalu which means uh, chewing uh, this gum which is normally extracted from plants especially chewing that kind of gum if it doesn't disintegrate and dissolves into the mouth then such kind of gum it is disliked to do it because there are certain kinds of gum which you keep in your mouth it dissolves and disintegrates and and if that disintegration and dissolved form of gum if it reaches the throat then this invalidates the fast but we are talking about we are talking about what we are talking about chewing the gum which doesn't disintegrate in the mouth then this is disliked this is disliked one should not do this wa in wajada ta'amahuma fi halqihi aftarsi if the taste of any of these things like he is talking about zawq at-ta'am the taste of food or the taste of this il or gum this gum if it 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 is felt in the throat or if it reaches the throat then this invalidates the fast but if it doesn't reaches the throat then it is disliked wal qublatu like kissing and being intimate are, are things which are of similar nature mimman tuharriku shahwatahu like for a person you know, like kissing and cuddling with one's wife if this thing if it stimulates a person's desires then this is disliked for this person to do those acts he should refrain from refrain from doing such kinds of act which stimulates his desires and ultimately may lead to uh, lead to his fast becoming invalidated if he ejaculates or if madhi uh, prostatic fluid comes out of him allahu alam has book now he is saying what is haram for a fasting person to do he says tahrumu in dhanna in zalanit all of these things for example this now he is talking about the qubla kissing or cuddling such kind of things if it is known that such things can lead to ejaculation then this is absolutely prohibited a person uh, this one we talked about it is dislike when when it is only known that this may uh you know like stimulate the desire then it is dislike but if it is like quite sure this person is quite sure that if he kisses the wife or if he cuddles with her then it if it he is quite sure that it may lead to uh, ejaculation then in that case it is absolutely haram he should not do it if he does it and if he doesn't ejaculates then he has committed something haram but his fast is okay why because he did he uh, did not ejaculate wa madu wa madu ilqin yatahallalu now this is earlier it was like this one was not uh, disintegrating into the mouth it doesn't dissolve into the mouth this one it dissolves into the mouth and disintegrates then this is also haram because there are chances that these disintegrated particles or the taste of this ill or gum may reach the throat and ultimately it leads to invalidation of the fast so it is uh, haram wakazibun lying lying as such it is impermissible at any time or any day or any month of the year but it is even more so in the month of ramadan so lying in the month of ramadan is haram the point to be noted is not every haram thing which a person commits in the month of ramadan is an invalidator of fast it is not necessary something which is haram then it should necessarily be an invalidator of fast it is not the case as we have seen lying doesn't invalidate your fast but it is a grave sin you have committed a sin while you are in the state of fasting likewise riba likewise riba and you are slandering someone so uh, this is you know backbiting someone this is also something highly prohibited and it is haram uh, even more so in the in the state when you are fasting wa namima namima is like a person goes from one to other with the intention of causing enmity between those two people he takes the words of this person goes to the other one and adds up lot of things to it 
with the intention of causing enmity between these two people. This is Nami. It is also prohibited. It is haram. Even more so in the state of fasting. Vashatamun, abusing someone. And things which are of similar nature. Even more, yani these, all, of, all these things are haram even more yani in an emphasized way in the month of Ramadan. Why you are doing a you know, great ibadah and during that period, if you do it, this is really haram. In fact, there are certain scholars who say that the fast becomes invalidated. Uh, if you are lie, if you backbite, if you do namima, if you curse someone, abuse someone, all these things, there are some scholars, though it is far from being correct, but this is the seriousness of this issue. Now, Nam has book. Now he's saying what is sunnah for a fasting person. He says it is recommended to be early in, you know, like uh, in breaking the fast. What is mean by early in breaking the fast is not like before the sun sets, you sit and start eating. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that the moment sun sets, if the sunset time is like, for example, 6.42, 6.42 p.m., for example, then the moment the sun sets, don't, you know, wait in a, you know, like in a, taking some precautions that we'll wait ahtiyatan five minutes or seven minutes and then we'll break the fast. No, the moment sun sets, you know, the sun has set 6.42, break your fast at 6.42. This is what it means by tajil ufitrin. Watakhiru suhurin, the pre-dawn meal. Trakhir means Eat it as, as later as you can. And don't, there are some people, what they do? They eat, like after Taravi, they come, they eat at that time, then, then, then they uh, don't wake up. Sometimes they even don't wake up for Fajr. They eat before that. So, Tahiru Suhurin means wake up, you know, like do Qiyamul Layl if it is possible, then wake up at this later part of the night, uh, which is just before the, uh, the, salah, the Azan of Fajr, and eat during that period. There is blessing in that food. So, Taakhiru Suhurin until just before the time of Azan. Delay your Suhur up to that time. Okay. This is what is mean by that. It doesn't mean that you Taakhir, you do delay the Suhur after the even, you know, like the Azan has been given. No. But delay it right before the uh, time of Azan ul-Fajr. Waqawluma warada in the fitrin. Likewise, you know, you are saying those authenticate supplications which are available to be said at the time of Fitr. It is Highly recommended that you say those supplications. The supplication which is known to be said is like Bismillah is what you say when you start eating the 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 iftar, and then after it, Inshallah, this is something which is uh, authentically proven. All other narrations which have come, they are not authentically uh, reported from the Prophet Sallallahu There are some kind of daaf and weakness in those narrations. Likewise, it is also Sunnah Masnoon to make up the fast number one immediately foran like immediately after uh, the eid uh, the eid ul fitr it is sunnah like it is not wajib it is sunnah to do them immediately why because a person is like recently he has fasted for 29 or 30 days he is in habit of fasting so it becomes easier for him if he does it immediately after the eid and tatabu means do it consecutively though it is allowed and permissible for him to like divide it into one whole year if he has like seven months or uh, seven days of fasting so he can divide it into seven weeks or even seven months but what is uh, recommended for this person is to do it consecutively one after the other because it is easier for him to do this there is a person who for example did not fast for seven days for a valid reason he did not fast seven days for a for a valid reason because of sickness or he was on traveling or it was she was a woman who did not fast for seven days because of her uh, uh, those known days she said she did not fast seven days now if this woman now the period which is open for him or her to make up for this fast is like 11 months she can or he can make up during these 11 months it is permissible it is allowed but if this person, for no reason, for no valid reason, if this person delays these seven days of fast until uh, the next Ramadan, now the next Ramadan have come, this person did not fast, 
the last Ramzan, seven days. Okay, the, and the new Ramadan have come. For example, he did not fast seven days in 1444. And the Ramadan for 1445 has started. So he has seven days remaining to be fasted, to make up. For what will What is the case for this person? The author is saying, if he does that, then number one, he has to, in any case, he has to make up the Qada after this Ramadan. Okay, after the Ramadan of 1445, he has to make up for those missed fast anyway. Seven days of fast he has to do. Along with it, it amu miskinin an kulli yaumin. He has to feed one poor person for every day of fast, which means he has to feed seven poor people. This is kind of a penalty for him because he delayed these fasts for no reason. Okay, now a situation. What if a person was, he fell sick, like he, he fasted for 15 days. Then he fell sick after the 15th day and he died even before the end of Ramadan. Is there anything upon this person? The scholars say, no, there is nothing. Why? Why? Because he had you know, a valid reason to not fast. He fell sick. So he had a valid reason. We, we talked earlier that you know a sick person, it is allowed for him if he feels hardship upon him, then for him it is allowed to not fast. So he stopped fasting for a very shara'i reason. And even before he could recover, he died. So there is nothing upon this person. Okay. Second person, he left seven fast. He did not fast seven days. Again, for a valid reason, he fell sick or he was a traveler. Now this person, he like remained alive for three months. This person, he regained the health. Okay. Like he did not fast for seven days in Ramadan. Then he regained health or he come he came back from travel or she was a woman so definitely her periods they ended so it was obligatory upon them to make up for this fast letter three months passed three months passed and uh, this person he died be it a woman or this sick person or a traveler he died after three months so what is to be done scholars say only qada and he, uh, no only this uh, they were uh, a poor person has to be fed why? Because they cannot make Qada now. They died. They died. So there is no Qada upon them. But poor person has to be fed, fed for each day of fast. Like seven days they did not fast. So they have to feed seven poor people. But they are not sinful. Why? Because this whole period of one year is a period of permissibility of fasting. Sharia has given them the permissibility of fasting in 11 months. Okay. So they died after three months. Though they were negligent, they should have fasted for this or made up for this fast. But since Sharia has given them the permissibility fast in 11 months, they died even before that. So they are not sinful, but a poor person has to be fed for each day of fasting they missed. And the third case we already discussed that this person, he did not fast for the whole year. And the next Ramadan came, then in that case, besides doing the Qada, they have to feed a poor person. Now, Now, this is also we discussed just now. The second case which I talked about in Matal Mufarrit. Mufarrit is the one who is negligent. Like I gave the example, he, a person did not fast for seven days. Now he was supposed to make up for these seven days uh, later after the Eid. This person, he was negligent. He got three months after that. He got recovered. He had three months to fast, but he died after three months. So he had the time of making up those seven fasts during these three months. So he is known as a mufarrit he is a negligent person so what is to be done only uh, poor people have to be fed from his wealth from his leftover wealth you know the tarika which he leaves behind inheritance from that inheritance money has to be taken why because this is the dain this is the loan of allah upon him and when the tarika is distributed there is a procedure which is to be followed if you can remember this uh, this word tadum tadum Ta, dal, wow, and meem. So this, you know, this this uh, procedure has to be followed in order to distribute the wealth. Tadum, tadum, ta is for tajhiz. Ta is for tajhiz, which means preparing the person for burial. So all kind of expenses which are there for uh, burying this person, right from you know uh, washing him, purchasing the shroud, giving the shroud for the grave, all those things have to be taken from his wealth first. So tajhiz has to be done from his own own wealth. 
Number two, tadum dal. Dal is for dain. Any kind of loan. This loan could be of another creation, human beings, or this loan could be also of Allah. So the fast is a loan on his head, on behalf of Allah, and he took a loan from Allah, which he did not fulfill. He has to fulfill this loan. Now, if he has died, what to be, what is to be done? Poor person have to be fed from this wealth. Allah is more rightful. He has more right of this, his haq and his dain to be fulfilled. So how is that to be fulfilled? Money is to be taken from his wealth and then uh, food is to be purchased and then distributed among the poor people. Tadum, wow, is the wasiya. Tadum, wow, is the wasiya. Then if there is any wasiya, then that wasiya, the will has to be executed and meme is the miras. Finally, after doing these three things previously, if there is anything left after tadum, after tadu, like ta, ta, dal, and wow, if anything is left, then it is to be distributed among the legal heirs and the inheritors. Then he says, Wala yusamu, but nobody will fast on behalf of this person. Why? Because this fast was obligatory upon him. The way a person who did not pray, is it possible for someone else to come and pray on behalf of some other person? That a person gives money to someone, okay, you go and pray on, pray on my behalf in masjid. If that is not done in the life of a person, then, then even more so after his death. So it, uh, this fast cannot be made up by, by someone else, even by the relative of the dead. However, again, there is some difference of opinion. There are some scholars who permit fasting on behalf of this person like a wali or his wakil or from someone from his inheritors. There are some scholars who allow doing that. Wallahu alam. Now, so now the, he is talking about the second case, okay, that there are certain situations wherein the qada has to be done by the wali or the inheritor or someone from the close relative of this individual. In kana alal mayiti, if this person who died, the person who died, if he vowed for a hajj or, a, or, or even umrah, like he vowed that, okay, upon me is hajj. I, it was not like obligatory hajj, but it was the hajj of nazar or the umrah of nazar. Then, it is obligatory for his wali or for the inheritor or his relative for someone from the relative to like uh, do the hajj on his behalf. So, nazrun min al hajji, if this person had a vow, he vowed to do hajj or he vowed uh, to fast one day or two day or whatever or he vowed to pray like I'll, I upon me is like two units of prayer and he died even before uh, praying these two units of prayer or things of similar nature. Then, it is recommended, not obligatory, okay? It is not obligatory. But it is only recommended for the wali or for the close relative of this individual or even not even relative. Someone, even neighbor can do it. A friend can do it. It is recommended for them to make up for this vow which he did not fulfill. And he died even before fulfilling it. Like if it is hajj or umrah or fasting or salat, then it is recommended, not obligatory, upon his friend or neighbor or close relative or anyone to make up for this uh, uh, this nazar and if there is a tariqa, if this person has a leftover wealth, then it is obligatory to take it from that and compulsorily, obligatorily uh, make it, like this person died and he had a lot of leftover wealth and this person vowed to do hajj, so now it becomes obligatory, take that money from this person's wealth, give it to someone, niaba, make someone deputy and ask him to do on his behalf. It is obligatory if he has left over wealth. But if he doesn't have wealth, then it is recommended for the wali or the close relative or the inheritor to do it. If he wishes, if he can do it. If he doesn't wishes, it is not obligatory upon him. La mubasharatu wali in. Like it is not absolutely necessary that a close relative should do it. Anyone, a friend can do as I said. A neighbor can do. Anyone can do. The, 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 the issue is uh, this vow should be fulfilled. Be it a close relative or be it a neighbor or be it a friend. Anyone can do it. Now. Now, 
So now the author has now started talking about the recommended fasts. What are the recommended voluntary fastings? And what are, what are those fasts which have been reported authentically from the Prophet for a person to fast, which are uh, which are like rewarding for a person? So you son know what are all things which are recommended? Number one, ayyamul bid. Ayyamul bid, which means fasting, normally fasting three months in a month, any time is highly recommended. Any time, three months or three days in any month, you can fast. Three days in a month at any time, like either you can fast first, second, third, you can fast first, seventh, tenth, you can fast like maybe twelfth, fifteenth, twenty ninth, three days in any month. It is recommended. Amongst them, even more preferable, even more preferable to fast the Ayyamul Bid, which are the white days, like 13th, 14th, and 15th. These are the days when the moon is like full moon. This is the reason they are known as Ayyamul Bid. So, Ayyamul Bid. Number two, well, Hamis, which is a Thursday and Monday. These two days are also Prophet in the Hadith of the Prophet it has come that Prophet used to fast on a Monday and a Thursday. Why? Because he said that the Amal are presented in front of Allah on these two days, on the Mondays and the Thursdays. So he says that I prefer that my Amal, my deeds are presented in front of Allah while I am in the state of fasting. Regarding al Ithnain, there is a narration from Ibn Abbas wherein Prophet has reported to have said that this was the day Prophet was born. This was the day when the revelation came down upon him. So, Prophet would fast on this day, Al Isnain. So, it is recommended that the person should fast on a Monday and a Thursday. Wasitin min Shawwalin, six days of Shawwal, which is the month which comes after the month of Ramadan. So, it is recommended for a person to fast six days of Shawwal. Now, these could be consecutive or it is allowed for a person to fast them with gaps also. There is no problem. The important thing is that these six fasts should be done in Shawwal. And after making up for the fast of Ramadan, if someone like a woman, she missed, missed seven fasting for her reason. So first she has to make up for those seven fasts and then she can do the six fast of Shawwal according to the uh, one of the opinions of the scholars. Washaharullahi, washaharullahi al-Muharram. The fastings which are most virtuous after the month of Ramadan is the fasting of the month of Muharram. Prophet Sallallahu would fast this month of Muharram. In fact, before Ramadan were made obligatory, Fasting in the month of Ramadan, uh, Muharram was obligatory. But later, month of Ramadan was made obligatory and then the month of Muharram's fasting were made voluntary. Like it was Sunnah. And Prophet Sallallahu would fast this month, uh, the month of Muharram. Along with it, which author has not mentioned, is the month of Shaban also. Prophet Sallallahu would fast almost all of Shaban. So that is also a month which is recommended to fast with the month which we are in right now. Wa'akaduhu in Muharram, the most emphasized is the 10th. The tenth of the Muharram. Okay, when Prophet came to Medina, they found that the Jews they used to fast on the tenth of Muharram. Upon asking, it was found that Musa salam was made victorious on this day, so they fasted. So Prophet said, "We are more rightful of Musa in comparison to them because he is our brother. So we'll fast on the tenth, and if Allah gives me life the next year, we'll also accompany tenth with the ninth. But Prophet did not uh, live the next year." So it was only 10th, but it is, this is the reason the scholars, they say that in uh, like in be in, you know, which is more emphasized, it is 10th and then after 10th, it comes the 9th. So a person should try to combine 9th with the 10th if it is possible for him. But if he is fasting on the 10th, it will suffice. But it is better for him to combine either 9th with it or 11th with it. Then he says, what is Zil Hijjati, the first nine days of Zil Hijj. Why not 10? Because the 10th is the day of Eid and it is haram to fast on the day of Eid. So first nine days of Zil Hijj, a person has to fast. This also includes the day of Arafah, which is, like Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I hope that it is an expiation for a year, uh, which is uh, the year which passed and the year which will come. So it is like an expiation for two years of sin. While the day of uh, uh, Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, it is an expiation for uh, one year, uh, past one year sin. So it is uh, sunnah to fast the first nine days of Zil Hij because no deeds are more beloved to Allah. Uh, yeah, the most, uh, yani the deeds which are most beloved to Allah uh, to be done are during these first 10 days or nine days or 10 days of Zil Hij. We cannot fast on the 10th because it is the day of Eid. So fasting the first nine days. So 10th, 11, 12, 13, the author will talk about the haram fasting a little later. And most emphasized of the first nine days is the day of Arafah. Yawmul Arafah, as I said, because 
it expires seen of two years past year and the coming year uh, definitely these are the minor sins li ghairi hajj in biha those who are not performing hajj for them it is sunna as for those who are performing hajj it is better for them not to fast it is better for them not to fast except for two people except for two kind of people the one who is performing hajj tamattu or the one who is performing hajj kiran and they have not they don't have money to slaughter animal which is hadi if they don't have money to slaughter an animal which is hadi then in their right the authors the scholars they say it is permissible for them to fast like 7 8 9 because allah says that you have to fast 3 days in the season of hajj and 7 days when you return back when you return back to your home so in order to you know fall those in order to make those 3 days fall in the season of hajj the scholars they say it is preferable for them to fast on the 7 8 and 9th or they can also fast on the 11 12th and 13th this is only specific to those uh, this the one who is doing hajj tamattu and the one who is doing hajj qiran and they did not carry with them the slaughtering animal or the hadi then he says wa afdalu asiyam the best siyam the best kind of fasting is the fasting of daud alaihi salam which means fasting alternate days one day of fasting and one day you don't fast and you fast the alternate days this is the best kind of fasting if somebody comes and says no i am capable of fasting every day no you will not get that kind of reward because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the best fasting is the fasting of daud alaihi salam he would fast one day and he would not fast the other day alternate day of fasting is the best kind of fasting now Now, his book. Now he is saying what is disliked. So he says. ifradu rajab in yani singling out rajab for fasting because this was what the quraish uh, and the mushrik mushrikeen of the makkah before islam they used to do they used to consider rajab you know in uh, uh, great venerity they would consider it a great month so just in order to not you know like be of those or appear like those people it is disliked to single out rajab for fasting Single night Rajab, but if somebody is like fasting Rajab and then Shaban together, then there is no harm. Likewise, well Juma, singling out Juma. So here everything is like ifradu al Juma. The singling out Juma Friday for fasting is also something which is disliked. But if somebody is fasting a day before it or day after it, then it is absolutely permissible. Likewise, according to the Mazhab, singling out Saturdays for fasting is also disliked. While the narrations concerning this are quite weak, quite weak. but still according to the mazhab singling out saturdays for fasting is disliked in the mazhab was shak we talked about the yawm ush shak earlier okay in the mazhab yawm ush shak is when the sky is clear on the 29th yani the sun sets on the 29th of shaban so now the next day is 30th of shaban if the moon is not sighted sky is clear moon is not sighted so the next day is 30th of shaban and according to the mazhab this day is known as yawm ush-shak and it is haram it is like dislike to fast on this day on the yawm ush-shak while there are certain scholars from the hanabi la itself they say that the yawm ush-shak is the day when there was this ghaim there was there were clouds or there was haze or it was raining moon could not be sighted according to the some very few they say now this day is the yawm ush-shak because there is possibility that the moon may have been sighted or possibility that it did not appear at all so this is the day which is known as yawm ush shak and it is disliked to fast on this day wa kulli eedin lil kuffar and it is also disliked to fast on every day or every such day wherein the eid or the festival of kuffar they fall like for example somebody fasting the day of christmas though he is fasting it for allah but it is disliked to fast on those days less people may you know like 
take it otherwise. That why maybe like as if he is venerating their day of Eid. So it is dislike to fast on day on those days. The like the Nero, like the uh, Nairos, which is the new day or new year of the uh, fire worshippers. So it is disliked for a Muslim to fast on those days. But taqaddum Ramadan abhi yawmin or yawmin. Likewise, yani, uh, welcoming the Ramadan, yani Ramadan has not yet come and person is fasting like 28th or 29th or 29th of Shaban and the 30th of Shaban. This is something which is disliked. Robert Salaam, he disliked it that a person fast a day or two uh, in advance for Ramadan. Ma'alam yuwafi qadatan fil qul. But again, there is a uh, concession here that if a person is habituated, yani he, has, he is habituated upon fasting, and if those days they like they fall on one of these days, then there is no harm. Like a person is, uh, like he is habituated to fast the 12, 13, 13, 14, and 15th of a month. And if it happens to fall, you know, in one of these days, then it is absolutely fine. Like if it falls on the uh, day of Christmas, absolutely fine. For example, if Monday falls on a Christmas and this person is uh, habituated to fast on a Monday, no problem, he can fast it. Or if it falls on a Saturday, he can fast it, no problem. So as long as if this person is habituated to fasting on those days, then for such a person, there is no harm. But for others, they should avoid that because it is disliked. Then he says, Vaharu Masaumu, what are the days when it is prohibited to fast? Then al in Mutlakan, absolute sense. You cannot fast on the day of Idul Fitr and you cannot fast on the day of Idul Adha. Prophet Sallallahu prohibited fasting on these two days. If somebody fast, his fast is invalid and he is sinful for committing an haram act. Likewise, the days of Tashriq, which are the days of eating and drinking and doing the zikr of Allah. So, you are a host of Allah on these three days. So, who are you to deny, uh, be, you know, like to deny this favor from Allah? So, fasting on the days of 11th, 12th and 13th of Zilhij is haram. It is prohibited. Except, as I said earlier, except for the one who is performing Hajj Tamattu, or for the one who is performing Hajj Qiran and he has no uh, this uh, sacrificial animal with him. So in that case, in order to make up for this, he has to fast 10 days. Three days while in, in, in the season of Hajj and seven days when he uh, returns back to his home as it has come in the Quran. Then he says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَ فِي فَرْدٍ مُوَسَّعِينَ هَرُمَ قَطْعُهُ بِلَا عُزْرٍ A person who, like, uh, now he's talking about the issue of doing an ibadah. First, a person started doing an ibadah. He started doing an ibadah and uh, uh, now this person intends to, uh, you know, like cut short this ibadah. For example, a person started praying Salatul Zuhar. Now the time of Salatul Zuhar is like, like three hours. He can pray anywhere bet uh, in between or during these three hours, like from the time of Zawal until the time of Asar. So this is Muasa, for the Muasa, it has like enough time. He can pray anywhere or uh, any time between this these two times between time of Zawal and Asar. He started praying Salat al-Zuhar. Is it permissible for him to cut this uh, prayer short without any valid reason? The author is saying no. Haruma. Katuhu. It is haram. To cut this ibadah short or without any valid reason. If he has a valid reason like he fell sick or you know like he fell sick or there is some pressing need which came like he felt like urinating or he felt like attending the call of nature, then it is permissible for him. But for no valid reason, then he cannot cut. Once he has started in the ibadah, he has to complete it. He has to complete it. Aw naflin ghairi hajjin wa umratin puriha bila uzrin. Even if it is nafl ibadah, a voluntary prayer or a voluntary fasting. So in case if it is a voluntary fasting, it is only disliked. For example, it is voluntary prayer. Can a person discontinue and break the voluntary prayer in between? Yes, it is permissible for him uh, that he can break the voluntary prayer, but it is disliked if it is done without a reason. But if he has a reason, then this karaha, it goes away. Except for Hajj and Umrah. Except for Hajj and Umrah. Even if this Hajj and Umrah are voluntary, not obligatory, it is compulsory, it is obligatory upon this person to complete the Hajj and Umrah. Allah says in the Quran. They have to complete it. Even if they are Nafl Hajj and Nafl Umrah, he has to com complete. He cannot cut short the Nafl Hajj and Nafl uh, Umrah as against any other ibadah like fasting and Salat and uh, Etikaf. If it is Nafl, it is permissible for this person to end it in between. 
but it is better not to do that and complete the ibadah it is disliked if he is doing it without any valid reason wallahu alam now Hasbuk, 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 hasbuk. Now the author is talking about this is the last, uh, you know, you can call the last fasl in the Kitab al Siyam. Wal etekafu sunnatun. Etekaf is from the word akafa, ain, kaf, and fa, which comes in the meaning of to stay some, to stay somewhere, to stay somewhere. Yani mutlakan. In the language, in the language, it comes in the meaning of staying somewhere. Al muksu. Al etekaf is sunna when it comes in the Sharia meaning, al etikaf it comes in the meaning of sticking to the masjid, yani making the masjid, yani sticking to the masjid with the intention of doing ibadah, seeking nearness to Allah. This is etikaf in, in, in Sharia. So this etikaf in Sharia, it is sunnah. It is highly recommended. Prophet Salaam would do it, especially uh, in the month of Ramadan and even more so in the last 10 days of Ramadan because of the great importance of these last 10 nights, because there is a night in these 10 days, which is known as Laylatul Qadri. So, Atiqaf is Sunnah. Wala yasihu mimman talzamuhu al jamaatu illa fi masjidin tuqamu fihi. Yani tuqamu fihi al jamaatu. This, where, where this Atiqaf has to be done. The place of this Atiqaf is masjid. You cannot do it, at, do it at home. Even those women who do it at home, it is not Atiqaf. You may have heard of women doing Atiqaf at home. This is not permissible. This is not Atiqaf. The place of Atiqaf is masjid. Has to be done in masjid. So, wala yasihu mimman tal zamuhu al jamaatu. Those upon whom the jamaat, yani congregational player prayer, is obligatory upon those individuals, then it is not correct. The etikaf is not correct from them except in the masjid. Who are those? This is normally discussed in the book of prayers, Kitabu Salat. That the jamaat is like it is not obligatory upon women. It is not obligatory upon young children. It is not obligatory upon uh, like uh, people uh, like sick person so they are the ones who are excused from praying in congregation so a woman if uh, but again this doesn't mean that she will not do it in the masjid like there is a condition to come ufihi. so what is mean by this is that uh, there is a person upon whom congregational player is obligatory so he will do a takeoff where in the masjid with the condition that this masjid should be the masjid where congregational prayer is established five times a day. So he will only do in those places. Like it should not be an abandoned masjid where prayers are not taking place at all. But who are the ones who can do etikaf in abandoned masjid? For example, they are the ones upon whom congregation is not obligatory. Who are they? Woman, sick person, small child. They can do etikaf in those places. This is what is mean by this statement. In which congregational prayer is established five times a day. In Ata Alehi Salatun, this is again like from the Mufradat of the Mazhab. Mazhab is like alone in this. They say that that etikaf can be done even if it is for an hour or even less than that. Even if you are like going to the masjid. Even if you are going for attending a dars or a lecture, then have the intention of etikaf. So even if it is for an hour or half an hour, if you are entering the masjid with the intention of etikaf, you will get reward, you will gain the reward of etikaf. This is according to the mazhab. But according to the majority of the scholars, the minimum period for doing etikaf is one day and one night. But according to the mazhab, as I said, even a moment, even few minutes, even half an hour is like enough for you to do etikaf if you have intention. Hana Bila Rahimahumullah, they say, when you enter the masjid, even for attending a lecture, have the intention of etikaf because you are staying there. You are going to spend some time there and you are spending this time for a great deed of seeking knowledge. So why not combine the combine the intention of etikaf with it? So this is the reason they are saying, in Atta Alehi Salatun, yani, if you are going to a masjid where a dars or a lecture is taking place, even if this masjid is a masjid where 
five congreg congregational prayers are not taking place. But you are going there for half an hour, which is not the time of prayer. So it is permissible for you to go there and do the etikaf. Why? Because the time when you are the time that you are spending in that masjid is the time where no obligatory prayer is falling. So you can go there and do the etikaf for half an hour and come back. This is what is mean by this. Then he says, Vashuri talahu taharatun mimma yujibu ghuslan. Now there is a condition. What is the condition for your etikaf to be correct? You should be tahir, you should be clean from all those things which necessitated ghusl, which means you should not be in major ritual impurity. This could be either because of sexual intercourse or it could be either because of a woman in her uh, menses or post childbirth breathing. So these people, they cannot do etikaf until they become clean from these things. Now, okay. Now, if a person vowed, he made a nazar of doing etekaf. Nazarahu means nazar al etekaf. Avis salata means nazara as salata. He vowed to pray uh, or he vowed to do etekaf in a masjid, any masjid, other than these three masajid. What are those three masajid? Masjidul Haram, Masjidul Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Masjidul Aqsa. If a person intends, for example, uh, a masjid of his area, a person intended to or vowed to do etikaf in one of the masjid of his area or he intended or he uh, vowed or did nazar to pray two units of prayer in one of the masjid of his area. Then what is upon him? The author is saying falahu feluhu fi ghairihi, which means now he has an option. Either he should fulfill this vow by praying in that masjid or by doing etikaf in that particular masjid or he can do anywhere else. Why? Because all the masajid are same in terms of virtue, other than those three masajid which we'll talk about. So he can do etikaf or pray in any of the masjid or in that masjid. It will not. It, it will. It, it is as if he fulfilled his vow. Wafi ahdiha falahu felu fiha wafil afdal. But if he intended or if he vowed to do etikaf or pray in one of these three masajid, like in Masjid al Haram or Masjid al Nabi or Masjid al Aqsa, then he has to either do in it. Or the one which is better than it. For example, a person vowed to do etikaf in Masjid al Aqsa. Then he has either the option to do it in Masjid al Aqsa or do it in Masjid al Nabi or in Masjid al Haram because both of them are more virtuous than Masjid al Aqsa. But if a person he vowed to do etikaf in Masjid al Haram, then he has no other option. He has to do it in Masjid al Haram, either etikaf or prayer because no other Masjid is more virtuous than Masjid al Haram. This is what is mean by it. Wa as I said, Masjid al Haram, it is the most virtuous of them. Then come next, which is Masjid al Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then the Masjid al Aqsa. Now, Mania Takafa, Mania Takafa, Mania Takafa. Okay. So now we are coming to the end of this session. The author now says, uh, Now this is, he is talking about, we talked about that originally, etikaf is sunnah. It is sunnah muakkada, it is sunnah. Anyone who intends or wishes to do etikaf, he can do it is an ibada. It is sunnah. But what if a person makes it compulsory upon himself by vowing or doing a vow or doing a nazar? It is an etikaf of nazar, for example. He made it obligatory upon himself, which originally the sharia did not obligate upon him. If it is the case of this nature, wherein he made an etikaf obligatory upon himself uh, because of a vow, then, and especially this etikaf is like, for example, three days, five days consecutively, like he's, he made a nazar, that I will do etikaf for the sake of Allah for four days or for five days. So now this is an etikaf of nazar, mutatabian, it is consecutive. So this person, it is not permitted for this person to go out of this etikaf, go out of the masjid from where he is doing etikaf, except for those things which are absolutely essential. Limala Buddha Minhu, for example, eating, 
drinking uh, attending the call of nature if those kind of arrangements are not inside the masjid but alhamdulillah in present day all of these things are available and within the masjid itself you will find the washroom and everything even it is possible uh, the food is also drink water is also readily available inside the masjid but in the olden days it was not the case when this when the author wrote this book but a person who is doing the nazar uh, or the etikaf of nazar especially mutatabian uh, nazar uh, etikaf which is like uh, for consecutive four or five days then this person should not go out of the masjid he should not go out of the masjid even he cannot visit the sick though visiting the sick has virtues prophet sallallahu alaihi said you know the one who visits the sick person without any you know like other intention like except for sincerely seeking reward from allah then the angels they seek forgiveness for this person so there is reward for visiting the sick person but a person who is doing etikaf especially etikaf of nazar that too consecutively then such a person cannot even visit a sick person he cannot even attend the janaza he cannot even attend the janaza except if he has made it conditional like before entering into the uh, etikaf he made a condition that i am uh, like i am uh, doing the nazar of doing etikaf for like 5 days with the condition that i will visit the sick or i will attend the janaza then in that case there is no harm but if he has not made these conditions and if he goes out of the etikaf Okay, for things which are not necessary, because we said La Buddha Minhu, those things were must necessary for him to go out for eating, drinking, or something of that nature, then it will not affect his ethica. But for other than these things, which are like not essential and not necessary, and if he is still going out of it, then in that case his ethica becomes affected, which means his ethica is like invalid. And he has to begin the ethica again. Because this was the ethica of Nazar. And we said originally ethica is Sunnah. But when he vowed it, it became obligatory. When it became obligatory, Qada is necessary. He has to make it uh, a makeup for this etikaf. Even more, if the, the scholars, they say, if this etikaf is like, he, for example, one is like uh, three days, but any three days. He is not specific with those three days. But for example, if he says, I will fast uh, 12th, 13th, and, or 13th, 14th, and 15th of a month. And he vowed it. And he did not fast on these 12, or he, for example, he started uh, doing etikaf on the uh, 13th, for example. And then he went out of the masjid without any valid reason, which means now his etikaf is invalid. His etikaf became invalid because he went out of the masjid for no need. So what is to be done? He has to make up for this etikaf again when, again on the 13th, 14th and 15th of the next month. Why? Because it was a specific etikaf. He intended to do it on the 13th, 14th and 15th. And if he is not able to do on those dates, then the scholars, they say he, there has to be a kafara has to be paid for it, which the author is going to talk about. So uh, uh, this is the situation of etikaf, especially the one which a person has vowed and made it obligatory upon himself. And it has like if it is mutatabian, then it becomes invalid and he has to again start from number one. If he vowed for three days of etikaf and if he went uh, goes out of the masjid for no valid reason, he again has to start from number one and he has to do etikaf for three days. Now, what is the thing which invalidates the etikaf? He says that uh, intercourse in the farj, any yani actual jima, it invalidates the etikaf. If a person, while in this, he is in the masjid doing etikaf, and if he does intercourse with the wife, then such an uh, etikaf it becomes invalid. Likewise, inzal, like uh, there is no intercourse, but because of uh, intimacy. Uh, ejaculation takes place that also invalidates your etikaf if it is uh, like an etikaf of nazar then it has to be made up qada has to be done for it then he says but if it is like just a sunnah etikaf then it is not obligatory it is not uh, no makeup is necessary for that etikaf because originally it was sunnah it was not obligatory well, else, what it is like important a person should not you know do such kind of acts while he is doing a great ibadah now if a person he ends up invalidating the etikaf because of what because of this you uh, know like intercourse if he invalidates the etikaf then what becomes necessary kafaratu yamin in kafaratul yamin and what is kafaratul yamin it has come in in the quran in surah al-maida also the kafaratul yamin is like a person has to uh, like feed 10 poor people or clothe them clothe them or if that is not possible then he has to fast for 3 days okay so this is the kafaratu Yamin in which he has to give, he is not able to 
uh, and it is upon takhir yani he can do any one of these three he can fast for three days or he can feed 10 poor people and he can clothe them okay he can do any one of them so this is the kafara kafaratu al yamin then he says wa sunna bi ta'akkudin ishtighaluhu now what is recommended highly recommended when a person is doing i'tikaf what are the things which are absolutely necessary and even more emphasized is to busy this person should busy himself in things which will bring him closer to allah he should spend his spend his time in uh, reading the quran in praying uh, all those things which can bring him closer to allah he should spend his time in those things there are certain you know like there are scholars from the from the aslaf they would like dislike having uh, durus and uh, majalis of ilm during the month of ramzan especially during the last 10 nights they disliked it and they would busy themselves up with ibadat and recitation of the quran with the salat qiyamul layl and those kind of things they would refrain from uh, having the majalis of ilm during the last 10 days contrary to it is seen these days that people specifically arrange majalis of ilm during the last 10 days of ramadan uh, stages are set up and then lectures are delivered from stages uh, during the you know like initial part of the night like from 9 uh pm until like 12 1230 in the midnight this is something which is against the practice of the asla wash the nabu mala yani and to stay away from all those things which a person has nothing to do with uh, do with it all those things like you know like the youth especially they should pay attention to this fact they spend their time in mobile even though they are doing a take off they spend their time on mobile on the whatsapp watching tv serials and movies and uh, uh, comedy serials and such kind of thing this is something which a uh, person doing a takeoff should avoid wallahu alam naam subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik assalamu alaykum i wish you all the best barakallahu feekum